just means I'm old. <laughs> Thanks uh, to the SPATS organizing group, and uh, it's really a pleasure invitation to come down here and speak. Uh, I appreciate them allowing a Polak from Delaware to come all this way to speak. So uh, anyways, hopefully uh, you guys will get something out of it this morning, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> just a few disclosures. As was indicated, I, I actually serve on the, the medical advisory board for Footbeat. So in case you were wondering where the hell Delaware was, right? Uh, tiny little state. Uh, the capital is actually Dover, Dover Air Force Base, a big, big Air Force Base there. So we see these C-130s fly over us all the time. Um, tip to tip, believe it or not, 96 miles. And at its narrowest point, it's only nine miles wide. So, uh, yeah, but have beautiful beaches. Be believe it or not, southern Delaware, the beautiful beaches, the Atlantic Ocean opens up the lower third. So just in case you were wondering. Just uh, to kind of give us a, a start here, you'll see this, uh, this video here. It's actually on the return here. So watch the ball as it comes back. That's actually Abby Wambach. Abby, uh, she was playing professionally at the time here for the uh, Rochester, New York team. Uh, and this is typical of how concussions occur in soccer, especially this one here. She was not even expecting the ball to come. She was expecting her teammate to kick it and clear it, and unfortunately hit her in the head. So um, clearly dazed, confused. We as athletic trainers would note from the sideline that she probably is concussed, but at this time the rules were a little different, so the official allowed her to continue to play. The next day she was on a YouTube video uh, indicating that she probably should have come out of the game. You know, a lot of young girls watch her, and so anyways, arguably one of the best headers ever to play the game, both men and women. <clears throat> This was a, a play a few years ago, a Wisconsin-Alabama um, game. And the linebacker there for Wisconsin, clearly concussed, slow to get up, congratulates the other offensive lineman, and then finds himself <laughs> on the other side of the field. So athletic trainer there realizing that probably needs to come out of the game, right? So in terms of the definition of concussion, the the folks in Berlin, when we met in, in 2016, really simplified this. This definition used to be a lot longer. Uh, commotio cerebri is, is the Latin term. As you know, a lot of medical terms come from, from Latin. Um, but basically, a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces. I always like to use the analogy to my students and to parents or student athletes who know nothing about concussions. So just use the an analogy of a glass of ice and you fill it with water and you shake those cubes. The cubes are the brain moving in that, that, uh, that uh, vault, which is the glass, right, known as the skull. This was the previous definition from the meeting in 2012. You know, that group meets, the concussion and sport group meets every four years. They started in 2000, 2004. I actually had an opportunity to go to Prague and then they kind of closed off away the, the uh, 12 meeting. And then this last meeting in 16, they opened it up pretty much to the world. So when we met in, in Berlin, there was around 400 of us who all have an interest in sport-related concussion. This is the CDC's video on concussion. The only reason I show you this is that it's kind of interesting how much movement there occurs in the brain that's probably not the case, though. The brain's only moving a few millimeters. Nonetheless, I mean, when the brain moves in the skull, you know, that can shear off neurons, and depending on where that force is is where, you know, you get the concussion. And then obviously we as athletic trainers, we will see that clinically, and it could be balance disturbances, could be headache, could be nausea, could be dizziness, et cetera. But this clearly shows that the brain does move probably not that to, to the, not to that extent, same extent, but nonetheless. So sport-related concussions, you know, in the United States, it's, it, they really lump it together here as part of this 
uh, 15% occurring in sport. So in our world, in the big picture, you know, concussions are, are a small number of those concussions that occur in the world, certainly in the United States. And then you can see the graphic on the other side is just basically breaking down those concussions across the United States. And, you know, here, the, the number of sports that are the primary sport is, is the sport of American football and then followed by soccer, et cetera. This is the susceptible patient. This is an interesting graphic here, but you can kind of see how this, this all builds. I apologize, it doesn't really show you that clearly, but you know, a number of different systems can be affected uh, when, when an athlete is concussed, and so we have to rely on our clinical skills because we're the first ones to see them. So it's a clinical assessment, and this is not something that we send for an MRI and they say, oh yeah, you have a concussion. No, it's built on clinical symptoms. So we as athletic trainers, that's gonna be important for us to be able to have that skill set in place to be able to, to determine that, that individual. So really, you know, if, if, if all of these systems are affected, this is kind of the perfect storm, right? And you'll see as we, we get further into today's lecture that as athletic trainers, we need to start thinking outside of our traditional realm in terms of how we assess concussions, because it's much different in 2018 than it was back in 2000, and we need to evolve with that process. And we can learn a lot from our colleagues in other disciplines to help better us on the front lines, because the op ophthalmologist is not on the front lines on that sideline, it's us as athletic trainers. And that's important. And so if we can take some of those skills and put them into our own skill set, we are going to be better. We are going to be better. And hopefully at the end of today, with both this lecture and, and some of the, the hands-on stuff that I'll show you, you can take some of these things and, and use them in your own clinical practice. So head impact kinematics. I mean, you can see here, this is just the Newton's cradle. You might have seen these. Sometimes physicians have them sitting on their desk. But if you were ever wondering when those two balls hit each other, actually about 39 Gs, which is a pretty significant force, okay? You know, compare that to other everyday activities. You can see there as you plop down in your chair this morning about four Gs, an aggressive pillow fight, nine, 19 Gs, et cetera. <clears throat> and if you're really into this, a student at Virginia Tech wrote his entire master's thesis on everyday activities and the accelerations associated with them. So feel free to call that up at your local library. <clears throat> Another way of kind of looking at brain motion, if you think about it, if you take an egg and you actually shake it hard enough, when you crack that shell open, that, that yolk will be broken. The same thing happens with the brain. I mean, if you, you shake it enough, it's, it's, going to, it's going to have some damage done to it. So you can use the, the jello mold. If you push on top of that jello mold, which is kind of a linear force, the force just kind of shakes the jello mold all the way down. But if you put the, pick that jello mold up and you kind of twisted it like this, you'd have an ugly mess on the floor. Point being is that these rotational accelerations are really what we need to concern ourselves as athletic trainers. You know, that rotational force, you know, that athlete that gets that hit from the side where they're not seeing that, and they, 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 they suffer those rotational accelerations, much higher G-forces than the traditional linear force. And that's typical, you know, when you see boxing, for example, when the athlete or the, the boxer's hit in the jaw, and that's a rotational force, much more damaging to the brain than the linear forces are. And so, you know, in, in, in my world as a researcher as well as, a, you know, a clinician, we, we look at ways in which we can study this. And so we have built-in sensors in our helmets. We, we, we have sensors that our athletes wear in our soccer programs. And we're trying to measure and monitor those forces, especially over time. And I'll get to that here in a second with subconcussion. So check this out. This was a video that actually came out of West Point. They, they have this tradition at West Point the, uh, the, the young cadets, as they finish their freshman year, they have this, uh, this big pillow fight in the, the main commons area at West Point. And so you would think that these are America's best and brightest, right? So this particular year, they went freaking nuts. And instead of just pillows inside those pillowcases, they put helmets and they put metal, and so they're hitting each other. Are you kidding me? 
So from this event, about 30 uh, of the, the cadets were actually concussed. And uh, yeah, so probably don't want to do that in terms of pillow fight. So the acceleration of pillow fight with metal inside the, the pillowcases are probably going to be a little bit higher. This graphic is just showing you that, you know, as, as you're exposed to higher and higher accelerations, the chances of head injury are going to go up. I mean, that's intuitive, right? That's intuitive to us. And so this is a concern that I have in the sport of soccer where you can use your head to head the ball as a logical and tactical part of the game. Well, those forces, you know, over time, what happens over time? Same thing with football. What happens to those, those forces over time? Is there some threshold? You know, I probably, how many of you in here played football? Yeah, it's quite a few of you. You seem to be doing okay, right? So is there some point at which, you know, you get these exposures and you hit, you know, the, the threshold point and you walk off the cliff? So that's really, that's, that's the, 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 key, the key question, especially in the concussion world these days. This is just showing you a little spectrum here, but, you know, the traditional uh, threshold for concussion has always been set at around 100 Gs. Okay? This probably comes from work back in the 70s with the, the safety uh, test crash in, in Detroit. And so the threshold in our world has always been around 100 Gs. And it's interesting as you monitor G-forces during competition, you know, to see some of the, 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 uh, the forces that, that are actually uh, displayed on some of these, these sensors. In the sport of football, I mean, you can see some very, very high forces, 250, 300 Gs and yet the athlete's fine. In soccer, probably not that high. We've seen them as high as you know, 100 Gs, but that's typically when a head hits another head. It's not when the ball hits the head. <clears throat> and again, the elephant in the room, I was speaking uh, last April in uh, New York City at a meeting involving uh, Major League Soccer. And uh, you know, they got together all these, in these individuals who have an interest in head and head injuries, and, this is the elephant in the room in, in the sport of soccer, is, you know, how much is too much? And so one of the things that I did is I presented some work from, from Abby Wambach. Abby and I are friends because when she played at Florida between uh, 98 and 2001, she never graduated, believe it or not, um, you know, we developed a relationship and she went on and played professionally and played in the, you know, the, for the U.S. national team. And I calculated that she's probably in her career over 10,000 times she's headed the ball. That's probably a very safe, uh, conservative estimate. You know, she's now about, I think, 37 or 38 years old. We're all curious. We're all curious. What, what does Abby's brain look like? And I've asked her on several occasions, because I have a good friend in, in New York City at Albert Einstein Medical Center who is willing to put her in the scanner and let's just look at her brain. But she's not at that stage yet. She, she doesn't want to know. And so, you know, this is, this is interesting. What, what happens with all of these, these, uh, these hits to the head, whether it's soccer or football or whatever? And so that, that's really the, 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 the key question. And, and, and Dr. Bales, who, whom most of you know from the movie Concussion, you know, he's a team physician for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he, he really talks a lot about this subconcussive effect, but you think of it as a glass of wine and when the, the brain kind of shakes back and forth. But, you know, clinically, the athlete doesn't come to us and say, geez, I have a concussion or I'm dizzy. Or, they, they don't because it's sub-threshold. It's, it's beneath that threshold. So I liken it to this graphic. This graphic really was explaining concussion and concussion management. But if you think about it, that, that's where subconcussive effects are. They're in that subconcussive threshold. They're in you know, again, the athlete's not telling us they have any signs or symptoms, okay? But what happens over time? And it, it, you know, we're curious with this, too, because at Delaware, we've been studying this 15 years in our men's and women's soccer players. So, you know, many of them have left UD, and they have families now, and they're in, successful in their careers. And so we're able to monitor them over time. Very simple. We can just do some simple online surveys with them, ask them how they're doing, how they're feeling, and you know, any of the signs and symptoms that we typically would associate with concussion. You know, are they having any of that in, in the long term? And so this would be kind of interesting as we move forward with, the, with this discussion, just to monitor those individuals. That's what's needed. We need to see that. 
you know, we, the, the folks in, in Boston have all done the, the, the autopsies on these, these former players. And that's a one-time snapshot. We, you know, we don't understand all that goes on in their, the, the world of these individuals who've died. But to truly have a perspective study where you monitor these individuals over a lifetime is really going to be critical. And we need that in our profession to better understand that. So basically, you know, th this, this article just came out, and, and, and it's, it, it's telling us that, we, you know, more data is, is, is needed. So here are some interesting recent headlines, you know, CTE in an individual without a history of trauma, right? Because we've all been brainwashed by today's media that says you have to have some traumatic event to produce the tau, the protein that accumulates in the brain. Well, this was a case that, that, that's, uh, that argues against that. And I have a colleague who's a physician over in, in, in London, and he, he, he swears that, you know, as you, get, as you age, you, you start to develop these tau proteins in your brain. And so, you know, you do autopsies on individuals who've died 80, 85 years old, they probably have signs of CTE. So we need to just be careful of that. Uh, acute plasma tau, uh, prolonged return after concussion. Um, you know, blood biomarkers, I'm going to come back to this a little bit here in a second because I think that this is starting to infiltrate our world, right? So as parents that you deal with, student athletes, the parents, you know, they're seeing all these headlines, there's a blood biomarker out there, we can do a blood test with our athletes. No, 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 no. You know, that, that technology is not uh, refined enough. And so the NATA actually came out, right? So this is the NATA Now blog. Um, and, uh, you know, they came out with a statement uh, just saying, you know, be, be cautious of this because that, that blood test is really not, uh, you know, foolproof. And, and I went on and wrote an, an editorial. You can call this up online if you want. It's, some of you know this is a famous saying, right, by Lee Corso every weekend college game day, right? So he'll, he'll take his pencil and he'll wave it in the face of Herbie Kirk Herb Street and say, not so fast, not so fast. So what I did was I wrote an article, an editorial in my journal, saying, you know what, not so fast. Because really it's about us as athletic trainers. And I advocate for ATs. We are the ones on the sideline doing these evaluations. And believe me, folks, that's not going away anytime soon. And it's not the day that we're going to be able to pinprick somebody's finger and say that they're diagnosed with a concussion. That's, we're not there yet. We're not there. And so not, not so fast. Okay, not so fast. So, you know, in terms of the management process, you know, we, we deal with a, a, a very diverse group of individuals. Um, you know, all of these players are involved in the process, right? So physicians, physicians assistants, nurse practitioners. In some states, nurse practitioners can make the, the return to play decision. This is freaking scary, to be quite honest with you, okay? And this is the case in Delaware, because I, de I deal with nurse practitioners in our, in our clinical setting, and not all of them are well-versed in concussion management. We are the experts. We are the experts. And I know your hands are tied in some of those situations. It's very difficult. We end up educating our physicians, because you guys, you're, you're the skilled professional. You know what you're doing in terms of concussion management. And I'm here today just to make sure that you're continuing to do that and do it even better. Okay? So there's a lot of players here in, in, in the world of concussion management. And we as athletic trainers, especially in that group of individuals who do not get better, you've all had those athletes, the, the concussion that make it into the 10 percenters. That group is probably growing a little bit more as our management e evolves. That's probably working into the 15%. And we need to farm those out. We need to rely on our professionals in other areas to do that and to help us. And again, the, the, the pro world gets all the, the, the uh, publicity, the collegiate world, but let's face it, you, most of you in here are working in high school setting. That's where the, the large number of athletes are in the world, right? I mean, this, look at these numbers. So, and it's just not a guy problem. I mean, lots of you know, in terms of this high school data, you know, looking at the sports there, boys ice hockey, boys lacrosse, girls soccer, girls lacrosse, girls basketball, all up there at the top 
in terms of the number of concussions. So, you know, we, we all know this, what's, what's made it such a big deal. The media, certainly in the United States, I travel a lot to Europe, and this, this it's not talked about too much in Europe, at least not yet. In, in England it is a little bit more, but the other European countries, it's, it's not talked about. Um, it's certainly as much as it is here, but better science and research has helped. And then, of course, we've had our high-profile cases, you know, the movie Concussion, the Zach Lydex story in Washington, this young man from Iowa. And then, you know, other issues that we deal with as athletic trainers, certainly the post-concussion syndrome and, you know, return to learn. And you guys are, you know, you, you live that world because, you know, you're involved with your school nurses and developing some of these plans for athletes with concussions that have to return to school, et cetera. This was an interesting editorial back in 2015 by a, a physician of all people who wrote this, and he just said, you know, it's just crazy. Parents need to stop obsessing about concussions. And this is the media, right? It, we, 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 parents think they know so much, and then you as the athletic trainer on the ground have to deal with that individual. You know, are you doing the right tests? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? because they saw some article in the, in the newspaper or online. And certainly editorials everywhere. I've written several in my journal and throughout. And I just put a plug here for my journal, as was indicated. You know, I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of this journal. We've actually just celebrating our 10th, 10th anniversary now. So I'm actually surprised that it was able to stay around this long. But I think we've, we've been able to, to create a nice little niche that, you know, it, it's easy to read and it's it's very useful for our, our readership. So and it's completely online as well. So if, if any of you need to, to see that, feel free to check it out. The kids have a website, kidsconcussion.com. So what's the big deal for me as a healthcare professional? I think, well, you know, we, we, we live in a litigious society, so we, we always need to concern ourselves with, with, with lawyers, right? And, and and people that could potentially sue us. So you know, that's, that's why it's important to us, and, you know, you, you can look around every day at the headlines. I, I share this with you. So check this, this out. You'll see that's a classic fencing response right there. Tom Savage, he was the quarterback for the Houston Texans. This was last year. Watch his head. You can't really see it there, but you'll see it here in the next you know, he hit, his head hit the turf. I mean, that, that you know, the classic coup contra coup mechanism. <clears throat> and you can see that clearly can cost. But that response is actually called the fencing response. And it, it's, it's really a very simple uh, response by the brain. Actually, the brain stem. You think about the brain stem. You know, the brain stem is at the base of the brain, right? So you pick the brain up, and there's the brain stem that's coming off. It, it, it's, it's a very primitive part of the brain because a lot of our vital functions are controlled there, right? This concussion, when you see the fencing response, that means that the brain stem has been concussed. So the brain stem, the base of the brain went like this. Well, you, you think about that as an athletic trainer, you're saying, geez, th that's, when I see that fencing response, you see the fencing response is this, right? That's the fencing response, okay? And so typically, when an athlete were, were, were boxing, they get hit, and they fall to the ground like this, their arms are up, so we call that the fencing response. But anytime you see that, you're thinking, geez, this is serious injury. That athlete went back to the game. That athlete went back to the game. Okay, so clearly those are visible signs. I'm going to get to that here in a second. That we as athletic trainers, you see that that athlete does not go back to the game. It's clearly a concussed portion of the brain. And you think about the brain stem, that's controlling very vital functions. Respiration, heart rate, okay? And clearly that had, was concussed because that's the sign or symptom that's produced from it. So. Just a brief overview here of legal, right? This is why we're, we're on top of our game. We're on top of our game because we have a legal responsibility to that student athlete that's under our care, okay? And so two, two key terms here, right? Liability, sure, make sure that you know, you're, you're doing what you're expected to do. 
And if you're not, rewrite that. Rewrite that job description. Because I'll guarantee you that the individual that's suing you, they know exactly what's in that job description. Okay? So that's important to you. But more more important, folks, is the standard of care. What is the standard of care on June 9th, 2018? This stuff has evolved. I'm an old guy. This stuff has changed a lot. I look back at my time practicing at small little Division III school, Alfred University in New York, and the football concussion, and athletes who were concussed in the first half were returning to play second half. And I'm still good friends with, with one that I, I clearly remember. And every time I see him, I'm, at, I'm like giving him a hug and just like, I'm glad you're okay. Inside, I'm saying that, you know, geez, don't die on my watch, you know. But it's evolved, right? I mean, we, that's, that's the beauty of our practice, right? Medicine has evolved. And so we need to evolve with that. And I guess that's why you're here this morning, right? The two EVP credits get your, get your butt in here, right? <clears throat> but anyways, what, so how do we avoid those legal liabilities, right? So we know the profession and its standards is a big deal, right? All those other things are important. And obviously, the reason that you're here today is participating in continuing education. This stuff changes. This stuff changes. My students who go out and work at our clinical sites, our preceptors love them because they know they're getting the cutting edge on this stuff, especially as it relates to concussion. And so what's the latest? What's Dr. K teaching in class? You know? And so they're able to kind of stay on top of their game. And so that's why you do this. I mean, this is important. As much as the social aspects of going to these meetings are, it's important too. But Well, I'm, I'm well-versed in treating, right? So with more attention on the sport-related concussions, we are under the spotlight more than ever, more than ever. And so we really need to stay on top of our care. And again, the failure to meet the standard of care is the big deal. What is the current standard of care? That's what you need to understand, and that's what you need to know. Okay? And, you know, unfortunate in the cases of either actions or inactions, the coach or athletic trainer are often blamed. And typically the, the, the attacks involve either the evaluation, something you did or you did not do, you didn't document, communication with the athlete, education of the athlete. So, you know, the feds, maybe they'll get involved. A lot of this legislation has been stalled in Congress. Imagine that, right? Um, so, but, you know, the states have acted, right? So the majority of the state legislations regarding concussions have come, you know, from state bodies. And Texas is no, no different than, than the other states. Most states have it or have some type of concussion legislation. In the state of Delaware, we, we have a, a concussion uh, act as well. And so it really, they, they revolve around three different areas three different areas. So improve the education of concussion awareness to coaches, administrators, parents, student athletes, other healthcare professionals, immediate removal of any athletes suspected, and then, you know, the, the return to play, some type of return to play mechanism or sign off or check off. Okay? Who's going who's gonna to be able to be the ultimate person to decide whether they return to play? And I, I understand in your world this is difficult. Because there are physicians who are signing off and you're saying, whoa, why are they signing off? This athlete's not ready to go back, right? <clears throat> this is just a sample of the state of, of Illinois. Not that that's a big deal, but I know in the state of Texas, you actually have one of the more detailed and comprehensive uh, acts uh, in, the, in the United States. And so, you know, as practicing professionals, you need to understand that. I always say to my students who just graduated, they might join the workforce force immediately. Wherever you land, you need to understand your state and your state licensure. Just because you're BOC certified doesn't mean anything. If you're practicing in those states, you need to be, make yourself aware of whatever state statutes govern your practice. And that's going to be important for those individuals to do that. So again, kudos to the state of Texas. Again, I, I've not spoken to any of you about this. Maybe it's more of a hassle than it is good. but. Nonetheless, you have a very uh, robust uh, legislative act. And so will these change uh, 
you know, will they change what, what we're doing? Does this legislation change much? I think the bottom line is that it, it's probably just made the public more aware. So from an educational standpoint, I think it's done good. You know, we're, we're on top of our game as athletic trainers. That's not going to change. But I think that educating the public about concussion and, and, and some of that awareness tools is good. Most states, these acts govern primarily high school players, high school, middle school school students, they, some, very few go on and impact the recreational world. Some of you in here probably coach your son or daughter in Little League Baseball or soccer or football, whatever. And very few of these state acts actually push in or encroach into the, uh, into the recreational world. Some states do have that, but for the most part, this is really governing high school athletics. So. The remainder of the talk is really focused on what, what exactly is the standard of care. And so, you know, one just need to look to the BOC. Believe it or not, they actually have standard of care guidelines. And you can see that there are seven of them related to, again, direction, prevention, immediate care, examination assessment, so you start to see a little theme here. These are primarily, in my educational world, these are the, the primary domains in which we teach students and you know, uh, upcoming athletic training students and, and future athletic trainers. So again, the, those, those standards, this is the Berlin 2016 consensus statement. This is available to, to all of you online. You can easily get the PDF. And, uh, I'm going to talk about more of that. The NATA position statement. The problem with this is, you know, these take a long time to develop these position statements. I've, I was on the writing group for the ankle one. We actually started in 08 and it came out in 13. So it took us five or six years for it to come out. So they're very tedious. So by the time it comes out, you know, some of the information is outdated. So this was back in 2014. They're due for a, a new position statement. So hopefully that will come out soon. The NCAAs, those of you that work in NCAA settings, the NCAA Sports Medicine Handbook is a nice guide. Uh, the NAI, so there may be a few NAI uh, athletic trainers in the room that they have an athletic trainer's manual. And again, the majority of you in the room that are governed by the, the National Federation or certainly your high school uh, federation as well. So those are all good, good sources. In the state of Delaware, this is at the IAA, D Delaware Interscholastic Activities Association governs this. So these are policies that are handed right down to, to the number of schools. I said at the outset that at, in Delaware, very small state, right, 96 miles tip to tip, we have 56 high schools in this entire state of Delaware, 56, right? I suppose in Dallas, there's probably, I don't know, 100 in, in just in the da Dallas Metroplex, maybe even more, right? So 56 schools. So it's easy for us to impart legislation on just 56 high schools. And believe it or not, all 56 have athletic trainers, not full time. I mean, the, the model you have in place here in the state of Texas is a good model. Uh, very few have full time athletic trainers. They use, usually outreach from uh, local um, sports medicine practices. So what should you be doing, right? So just some highlights from the Berlin meeting. So this was the group leading up to that. So they did a lot of work before the meeting and then afterwards they wrote and then these documents came out. So this was all of us packed in a room at the Ritz Carlton in, in Berlin. I'd been in Berlin, it's interesting. I was in Berlin in 1992, shortly after the wall came down and it was a very archaic city at that time, and you know, going back almost 30 years later to see the transformation of the city of Berlin is, is absolutely amazing. Um, it's it's very vibrant, uh, very uh, yeah, very eclectic city now. So, anyways, a series of 12 questions were developed from these 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 experts, and from that. A, a bunch of things happened. So the topics that were included were definition and sideline screening, the SCAT tool, advanced and novel testing, uh, recovery, I'll talk a little bit about that, childhood concussion, persistent symptoms, and you know how can we uh, lower the risk. So this was the, uh, the document that came out. Again, you can, you can read that. So 
again, I think this is a must read because it's driving policy worldwide, including the United States. This is what the, the document that NCAA looks to now for the guidance in terms of concussion management. So this group is, is very influential in terms of concussion management. And from that, they, they, they put out the 11 R's of sport-related concussion management. I don't expect you guys to remember this. I mean, perhaps it's something that you can put in your fanny pack. Um, but as we go through this, you'll see it all makes sense. These, these 11 R's all make sense, right? So recognize, remove, reevaluate, rest, rehab, refer, recovery, return to sport, reconsider, residual effects, risk reduction, all make sense. And these are the areas that we have to be on top of our game as athletic trainers. And so we'll break that down. And this was a, a, an interesting read that just came out this past year. But basically, they took the guidelines that came from the, the Berlin meeting, and these are other sport organizations throughout the world. So rugby union, the NHL, the NFL, et cetera. They all got together and they, they talked about, you know, how can, we, how can we implement those guidelines? How does it make sense across the different organizations? And I applaud this group because they want to make it, make it right and make it best for their, their, their constituent groups, mainly the athletes that play. And so from that, <clears throat> some of the things that came about were defining and diagnosing concussion. This is us. This is us frontline folks. This is exactly what we do. We are the individuals to make that decision. You as the athletic trainer on the sideline are making this decision. It's a very, very critical first step. So how can we make your job easier? How can we make your job easier? What are the things that you need to be, be, be looking for? If you look at table one there, it's pretty obvious. Loss of concussion, confusion, amnesia, vacant look, motor incoordination, all that. That typically is gonna point to the fact that you have a concussion. But table two really talks about, you know, clutching the head, being slow to get up, you know, Superficial facial fracture, yeah, that probably makes sense too. But this is all about recog recognition. And how is that going to make our, you know, job easier? What, what can we do to see this? You know, one of the things that you would think the NFL benefits from is instant replay. It's, it's inter interesting, right? Big jumbo screens in all these stadiums. You, you know, is the athletic trainer, did he watch Tom Savage there as he got you know, hit? Who's, who's making that decision? And clearly, you know, fencing was Tom, okay? So they benefit from this technology, but I'm not sure they always use it. Now, the International Rugby Union is quite different. They actually have the athletic trainers on the sidelines have iPads, and they are getting real-time feeds of those playbacks. And so they use that technology to their advantage. Now, again, I'm not saying that this is going to become commonplace in a high school setting. We just don't have the capability to do that. But the technology that exists that these, these, uh, these organizations are using is good, is good. And so, you know, they get real-time feeds. And so some of the things that they're looking for there, you can see signs from the sideline, slow to get up, length, vacant stare, gait, ataxia, right? So their inability to, to walk smoothly. The Abby Wambach, that video I showed you at the outset, you know, she clearly got up and was concussed and yet stayed in the game. And so these are important things for you and I as athletic trainers to see and to make that decision. Chances are that athlete is concussed. Despite what the coach, oh, no, that's just, you know, they're shaking it off. No, they're not. Their brain has been concussed. And so we need to be able to do that. So again, I'm not sure about the role of technology, but especially in, the, in a smaller setting, but certainly the professional level, this is, this is becoming commonplace. And, and our Power Five schools, you're gonna see this is, this is gonna become commonplace. So again, just another article, what are the critical elements of the sideline screening tool that can be used? Again, the, 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 the tool of choice right now is the SCAT-5. Some might wonder, you know, it was the SCAT 3. Why did it jump to the SCAT 5? I asked that same question, because there was never a SCAT 4. And what happened was SCAT 3 came out in 12, okay? and then the fifth meeting of the concussion and sport group occurred in 2016 in Berlin. So from now on, they're going to just 
coincide it with each of those meetings, so it became SCAT 5. SCAT 4 never existed, and it jumped to SCAT 5. And again, that's tool of choice. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So here's the question. I know there's a lot of Texas fans in this room, um, but should this athlete have gone back into the game? Now, watching the slow-mo, you can clearly see that. Yeah, that's head hitting the turf pretty hard, okay? And was slow to get up, slow to get up, okay? Probably should not have returned. This happened in a Monday night football game. So Russell Wilson, quarterback for the Seahawks, Nice shot to the head right there. Right, came right up underneath his chin. And, you know, clearly looks like he's hurt. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because Donald Rich, who's one of my former students, is the head athletic trainer for the, the Seahawks. And he talks about this. You can see Donald right there. And they pull him into the tent. They do the evaluation. These athletes, they have huge egos, and a lot of times they think that they're in charge. And so before he knew it, Russell came out of the tent, grabbed his helmet, and was back out on the field. And the, 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 the Seahawks were actually fined for this. The, the organization was fined for this. But, you, you know, that, that clearly is a, is a case where uh, he probably should not have gone back to competition. Again, you know, these are high-level cases. I mean, we're working in the trenches at a high school setting. We're not going to have this instant replay. But nonetheless, the stakes are just as high. Okay? So again, management on and around the field of play, the SCAT 5 tool readily available to all of us. This is, this is standard of care. You need to be doing this. Um, <clears throat> what domains of clinical function should be assessed post-injury? You can see there cognitive, somatic, so that's overall body, ocular motor, that's an area we've not been involved in too much as athletic trainers. I'm going to show you in the, the little uh, lab portion of this, this talk this morning about some of the, the near point of convergence testing that we do, King Devic testing, getting an ocular motor, sleep, something we probably have not traditionally looked at, postural stability, I think we've done a pretty good job there, vestibular, cervical spine. So again, these are are, are tasks that as athletic trainers we need to become more competent and proficient at doing. And uh, so if you get opportunities to, to, to have and take part in workshops that involve some of these, these additional testing skills and become competent at it, I highly recommend that. And I'll show you some of this that we do here as part of the lab portion. <clears throat> So this was just a, the VOM screening that was put out by the NATA. This is a simple little handout. Um, uh, it actually came from our colleagues at Pittsburgh that do this. The problem I'm having with the VOMs is it takes a while to do it. To become proficient at it, it takes a little bit of time as well. But it takes you know 10 minutes. I'm not sure that this is something that we're going to be able to do, certainly on the sideline. I think there's some other tests that we can do on the sideline to measure this. Um, again, what are some of the advanced or novel techniques? And again, the, the group is looking at all of this, the advanced neuroimaging, the role of blood biomarkers and genetic testing. UD is involved as part of the NCAA uh, Department of Defense uh, project, and we, we just signed on for an additional two years, and part of that is actually saliva testing. So they're starting to look at, at DNA and genetics as part of this as well. So our athletes have to spit into a little... Uh, cylinder and then we send it to, to University of, or Indiana University for testing and so stay tuned on that front but it, like I said at the outset you know not so fast it's us as athletic trainers this is a concussions primarily are a clinical diagnosis we are the experts at doing that we are the experts at doing that again uh, you know, treatment interventions, what's the length of, of rest, both cognitive and physical rest, looking at signs and symptoms, the stand down time, all important. You know, rehab is, is really starting to blossom. Our colleagues at the University of Buffalo, Dr. Letty and his group, 
they're on to something with this, this uh, sub-maximal threshold activity post-concussion. The days of putting an athlete in a dark room for a week is gone by the wayside. There's, n there's no good evidence to support that. There's a lot of good evidence pointing to the fact that this sub-maximal low-level activity post-concussion is a good thing. And a little bit of cognitive Where the challenge, if you will, so challenging the, the you know the, the brain itself and not shutting it down. So, you know, rest and rehab. This is the Berlin's graduated return to play protocol. It didn't change much from the 2012 meeting, and we've probably most of us in this room have been doing this, right? So this graduated return to play protocol. So you're working with your physician that you're putting the athletes through this protocol before they make that return to play decision. And that's good education on your part because a lot of physicians might not be familiar with this. So now this is an interesting editorial that came out in 20, uh, 20, just after the 2016 meeting challenging that return to play protocol. And this was three particular studies. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this graphic, but basically a zero, a hazard ratio of zero is a good thing, or uh, even to, to, to the left of that is a good thing. That means that what you're doing in your return to play is actually benefiting the student athlete. Now, this graphic is important to understand this, that things to the right of that, the hazard ratio is actually above zero. That's not a good thing. That means that probably these athletes are going back a little too soon, a little too soon, despite what we have in, in our protocol in place. And of anything that I, they, that, that, I, that I took from the Berlin meeting in 2016 was a, an unbelievable discussion about something called the physiological tail. Now granted, this is a clinical diagnosis that you and I are making, and we rely heavily on our clinical skills balance, vision, signs and symptoms, neurocognitive testing, impact, whatever. That's, those are the tools we have at our disposal. And we make these decisions. Athletes in a return to play protocol, they're move, moving their way, and we make a decision, they go back to play. Then they say to us, hmm, there's some evidence that physiologically there are markers in the brain that are saying, there's still inflammation going on, even after we return these athletes to play. My freaking eyeballs came out of my head. I'm like, really? How does that impact us? How does that impact us? Right? And so, stay tuned. This is, th there's more to come with this, because I think what's happening is we're pushing the envelope a little too soon. We're pushing the envelope a little too soon and that we have what is called this physiological tail. So I ask the question, well, how long? You know, I talk to groups like this all the time. How long? That's the most obvious question. Well, how long, how much extra time do I need to wait, wait for? Can you imagine telling your coach, well, he's met all of the return to play protocol, but we're going to keep him out for another week. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. You know, get a new job, right? So stay tuned, this is important for us because the clinical tools that we use are saying to us, this athlete's ready to go back to competition. But the experts who study this and look at the brain, there's still some inflammation going on. I'm gonna come back to that point here in a second. So again, rest and treatment. Um, you know, low level activity is, is a benefit. I think that's a good thing. Again, that, that's pointing to all of that. This was an interesting editorial that was written um, this past year in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. <clears throat> and they talk about cognitive and physical rest, and they make this comment, because you guys, you, this will hit home with you. As it stands currently, cognitive rest is equivalent to punishing a teenager indefinitely. Right? You think about it. Take that cell phone away. You can't watch TV, you can't do video games, right? And then they go on and they, they write, when did text messaging and watching television show become as mentally challenging as algebra or physics? It's time to rethink the punishment approach to cognitive rest. And so my 
my suggestion to you as athletic trainers, we need to find that sweet spot. We need to be doing that low level activity, that low level exercise is good, and we need to be doing some of that low level cognitive challenge as well. We can't take their cell phones away because maybe we limit their use. But again, in their eyes, that's punishment. Okay. Again, this is getting at that physiological recovery. There's some, some you know, talk about you know, maybe there should be a, a minimum stand down period post injury. And I want you to read this. I want you to read this quote. It, it, it really makes sense, right? So W.H. Earl writes in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, every, page, every case of recent head injury, however trivial it may appear, should, we believe, be treated with the greatest consideration, less damage to hidden important structures, escape our attention, thus leaving a foundation for future trouble, which too often is irreparable. That makes sense to all of us in this room. Is that student athlete you deal with? This makes sense. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. You have an athlete tomorrow that has a syndesmotic ankle sprain. In your mind, immediately you're thinking probably what? At the very least, six weeks before they come back? You're good, right? You're good as an athletic trainer. You can get them back in six weeks. But you're thinking immediately, you're thinking six weeks, right? Six to eight weeks, good syndesmotic sprain. In some cases, the whole season, right? So I ask you this. That athlete gets that concussion on a Friday night football game. What, what the hell is the hurry to get them back the next week? After all, it's the brain. It's the brain. Now, here's the kicker on that. There's the quote. I dug this up. This is microfilm, right? This is not the G Journal of American Medical Association. I get a PDF sent to my inbox. I had to go do some old-fashioned digging in our library. But more importantly, look at the date. Okay, look at the date. So, two or excuse me, 1903. 1903. This quote came from. So I argue that what is the hurry? It's the brain. It's the brain. So let's, as athletic trainers, we need, to, we need to take that in consideration. It's not a big deal. It's not a hurry for us to get them ready for the next week's game, even if they've met all of those benchmarks, right? Maybe we need to have that, that minimum stand down period. What are some other key concussion modifiers? Obviously, the, the, the athlete who's had previous concussion, we know that's a big, huge risk factor for future concussion. Right? That soccer player, we have soccer players at Delaware who've had concussions, four or five concussions. Find a different sport. You know? Swimming's okay. You got a, you got a, a life ahead of you. You're not going to go play professional soccer, certainly not Delaware caliber anyways. Right? Find a different job or find a different career. Yeah, anyways. Again, uh, you know, children, we, we need to treat them differently. So those of you who might be working with young, younger kids, you know, 12, 13, that, that's a very, very uh, delicate process. You know, we need to treat them differently. Uh, again, post-concussion, as I mentioned earlier, this used to be the 10%, and it really is expanding to the 20 percenters. And that's just a testament to our own clinical skills. We're getting better at doing this stuff. We're picking these things up. This athlete's got balance disturbances. This athlete's got visual disturbances. They've got cervical neck pain. That's us. We're making those referrals. So this group is getting, getting larger. And again, our team of, of, of experts, uh, neuropsychologists, neurologists, specialized PTs. I was just on a phone call yesterday with a, a pediatric neurologist from Seattle. And you know, I couldn't imagine dealing with these individuals, you know, 20 years ago in this. But, you know, these are the individuals that can bring to the table an expertise set that helps us, helps better us as athletic trainers. <clears throat> Again, this is, you know, talking about the long-term sequelae of CT. We just don't know, and we need more studies of this. And this is that whole area of sub-concussion, what's, what's happening as we move, move these athletes through who been playing since they've been six years old and heading a ball or whatever. 
this country, thankfully, we changed the rules that, uh, I know I've got two hours, I'm okay on time. We'll do some hands-on stuff so you don't have to continue to listen to me, but. Um, you know, in this country, U.S. soccer changed the rules, so if you're 10 and under, believe it or not, and some of you might not even know this, but if you're 10 and under, you're not allowed to head the ball in soccer anymore. If you're between the ages of 11 and 13, you can begin to head the ball. U.S. soccer just made that rule up back in 2015. They gave zero guidance to coaches. Thus, the impetus behind me creating a program called Get Ahead Safely in Soccer. We gotta let our coaches know, what do, you, what do you teach these kids? And it's limited, they can't be heading you know, 100 headers. My colleague over in Madrid, Spain, he said there's no such rules over here. In Europe, five years old, they're heading the ball. It just makes sense intuitively, right? 10 year old probably shouldn't be heading the ball a lot. And who makes, someone could make the argument 11 to 13 year old shouldn't be heading the ball either. But at least we've got some guidance now. So stay tuned on this front. We need to, we need to understand this better. And you know, you, you guys are facing some of this. You know, the number of people that are playing high school football has declined a lot. Maybe not in the state of Texas, but I can guarantee in the state of Delaware it's declining bad, okay? So much so that school districts are now consolidating to play football. So they, you know, schools that used to be rivals are coming together just to field a team to play football. So, you know, stay tuned on that front. And, and the NFL is starting to do better there. Equipment, protective equipment, you know, how can we prevent some of this stuff is all good. In my world with soccer, neck strengthening is good, policy rule changes, protective equipment is all important. So other available resources, I just list a few here. I mean, there's lots of information out there. This is a good book, although, you know, these, the problem with textbooks is they become outdated as soon as they come, up, come about. So the take home message I think here is, you know, what, what's the clinical evaluation tip? Take your time, take them serious, make it personal, right? So you're dealing with your own son or daughter, make it technical and take responsibility. And that's the beauty of the profession that I so dearly love. I mean, I've been certified since 1984. I've been doing this since I was fifth grade. And we are the experts when it comes to concussion management. Despite what our colleagues in other professions might think, we are the experts. We are on the sidelines dealing with sport-related concussion on a week-to-week, -week, day day-to-day basis. So these are simple. These are simple rules to live by. And you can see the concussion solution is not simple. It's very, very complex. I mean, we, we look at it from the clinical side of things, but you know, others are, are really looking at it more globally as well. This is important. This was a good article that just came out do our concussion assessment tools have value? This is data from our NCAA project. They do have value, but they have value when we do more than just one single thing. It's multi, multi, multi. So it's calling on all things that are in our toolbox. It's just not impact. It's just not the best test. It's multi-dimensional. It's bringing all of those factors in. And that's what's going to make us better moving into the future as athletic trainers in terms of our skill set. We can't rely on an impact test. We can't rely solely on that impact test. And that this, this article basically says that. Educational programming is, is abundant. The NCAA, the National Federation High Schools all have good programs, CDC. And ATA puts out things. So this is all good from, from your perspective when you need to have educational documents. You give to your student athletes, give to your coaches, give to your parents. Think First is our colleagues up in Canada. It's a good program. Nationwide Children's Hospital out of Cincinnati. Very, very robust group here that's doing some good things. And believe it or not, a very simple YouTube video by Dr. Mike Evans. It's worth checking out, especially those of you that deal with younger student athletes, your freshmen and sophomores in high school, maybe middle school student athletes, you've got to deal with parents. Just give them a simple YouTube video to understand that. Again, the, 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 the role and responsibility of our concussion management teams, especially in a high school or, or a middle school environment, starts with us at the top. Maybe some of you have athletic training students, but all of those individuals have a vested interest in this process. Return to learn, obviously there's, there's a lot of 
information that's just starting to come out on this front, take advantage of those opportunities to better understand that. And just one final thought from this regard. I just think that teaching kids about concussions needs to start probably more so before they get to high school, right? Come on. My son is just 20 now, but he was, you know, just a few years ago, he was the high school know-it-all. He knows it all. These high school kids, they know it all, right? We're not going to change their behaviors at that level. So I argue, why not teach this in our physical education classes when these kids are, you know, third and fourth graders? That's probably where we need to teach them about concussions. You know, you hit your head, let somebody know, the athletic trainer, the coach, the school nurse. That's when you're going to change behaviors. You're not going to change behaviors. High school kids, they know it all. They know it all. And where this came to light is actually a couple years ago, I just had lunch a few, few days ago with uh, one of my students who graduated in 2014. She, she got her master's with us. But we did a really, really neat study. What we did is we, we went to these high schools. We had eight high schools. We had four high schools with service control. The other four got these posters. We created these posters. And we put them in life path points in the high school. Life path points, right? Cafeteria where these kids hang out. They pass by this every day. And they were messages about concussion, concussion awareness. We did a survey before and we did a survey after. And believe it or not, you would thought, you know, a whole uh, fall semester or fall uh, school year, these kids would change their behaviors about concussions. No difference between the control group who didn't have anything and these kids that had these posters. So that true, that was a testament to me that you, we're not going to change their behaviors at that age. And then lastly, I just, I show you this because it was mentioned in, in my introduction and believe me, I appreciate that, that introduction. It, you didn't have to say all that stuff about me. I, like I said, it's just about getting old. Anyways, we created this, this video, and it's free of charge. I know some of you probably in this room coach soccer, coach youth soccer. And so this is just kind of the highlights of that. So, you know, our group created that. We actually, I, I didn't think in, in uh, Northern California back two summers ago that it would be hot and humid, but the way it was really hot and humid, we were working with this group of young kids actually in an indoor facility, but it was so hot. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's a free of, free of charge. You can go to, actually, it's called the United Soccer Coaches now. The National Soccer Coaches Association actually changed names last year and it's free of charge. So those of you that work with youth soccer groups, maybe you can you know, impart that to their, uh, to their group. So anyways, uh, so I'll take some questions right now. Um, if you have questions about related to the lecture, if you want to take a bathroom break or chill out for a few minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll start back up with the, the kind of the hands-on portion, which I think you have a, uh, a handout. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. <clears throat> Just yell it out. Yeah, go ahead, in the back. Okay, the, so the question is in terms of the protein markers. Um, in our uh, particular project with the NCAA, there's, a, there's some schools that are called ARC schools. They're Advanced Research Corps. UCLA, University of Wisconsin, um, University of North Carolina, and there's one other school in there too. Um, and so they are doing these blood draws on the student athletes in addition to some of the baseline testing that I'm going to share with you. 
And so that's been part of their process moving forward. Uh, there's some other groups in the world that are looking at these protein uh, blood biomarkers as well. I think out of Boston is, is another group that's been looking at that. So that's, that's hot, hot area. It's a very expensive research tool. And uh, blood is an interesting uh, uh, solution to deal with. There's a lot going on in there. And I, I've been able to find that out from my colleagues at, at Delaware that it's not so simple. And so that's why I said not so fast. I, I, I just think it's going to be a long time before this job security for us as athletic trainers in terms of our clinical management of these on the sideline. So stay tuned on that front. Go ahead. Yeah, the question is related to the SCAT-5 and the amount of time that it takes. I mean, our uh, group is pretty f proficient at doing that. It takes about 10 minutes to do that. And so it's, it is time prohibitive, no, no question about it. Um, you know, I think that an important aspect of that is the symptoms. And I think you get at the symptom checklist and see, you know, if they, if they have any acute signs or symptoms. If you can do a BESS, you know, a modified BESS, uh, I think that, that that would be suggested as well. Um, and, and then maybe you can make a decision based on that. You know, looking at the other signs and symptoms too, that, you know, how did the athlete get up? You know, what was the hit? Again, that's our clinical judgment. You can't throw clinical judgment out. I mean, that's, that's an important aspect, right? Evidence-based medicine, it's about our clinical experience is one of the three component parts of evidence-based medicine. So we can't throw that out. I mean, our clinical judgment means something. That's important to us. We, you know, we don't have to be so pre-programmed and robotic. And, and that's the beauty of our profession, right? There's more ways to do it. But I, I would suggest that that, you know, I understand that on a busy sideline, it's difficult to do that. But I think you, if you can get at symptoms and certainly a, the, some measure of balance initially. I'll share with you the King Divic testing. That's an easy test as well. Uh, unfortunately, that you know, it's it, the, the, the rights to that are now protected, so it's, it, it costs. There's, you know, there's an expense associated with that. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The question is the multi-concussion athlete who shops around to get the approval to, to continue to play makes our job difficult, right? Uh, yeah, there, that, that's a tough one. Um, you know, my hope is that through continued bombardment and education on our part as healthcare professionals, that, you know, that athlete will soon realize that, you know, this is they're, this isn't the betterment of me, you know, to, to, to stop playing or choose another sport. But that's difficult, and that ties your hands as a clinician. I wish we were given a little bit more authority when it comes to that. Who knows, maybe in 50 years, athletic trainers will give it that authority, right? Um, anyway, it's a good question, and I understand your pain. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is related to, again, multiple concussions. Should the return to play protocol be a little bit different? Right now, the, the uh, Berlin guidelines do not have provisions for that multi-concussed athlete. I would argue that just based on what we know about that multi-concussed athlete is that we probably need to approach them differently. I think that the, the benchmarks need to be a little bit more rigorous and perhaps expanded on them. And that, especially if it were happening in the same sports season, 
um, that we take our time, we really, really take our time with those student athletes. I know that doesn't give you a kind of a black and white to follow, but I really think that we need to be much more conservative with that group than, uh, than we might be with that first time concussed athlete. So, other questions? Okay. So what we'll do now is uh, I'm just going to switch gears. I'm going to call up a different slide set. <clears throat> That's me. Just to explain a little bit about the DOD project. So uh, the funding is there. It, it comes from two sources, the NCAA, the Department of Defense. Uh, the Department of Defense has a lot of uh, vested interest in this with the four primary military academies. Um, the initial project is around 30 million, and now we're now into year four and five of the project. Uh, about 39,000 enrollees uh, are over that and, and more than 3,000 concussions. It's interesting, the original projections were they would get around 2,000 concussions. So over 3,000 concussions have occurred with the participating schools. There is so much, so much, so much data to come from this. And it's really going to help us drive practice as athletic trainers. I mean, just the one article that I just mentioned about do all of these concussion assessment tools work? And are, do they all have, um, uh, uh, you know, are they all affordable and, and, and useful in terms of our, our sideline management? And, and I think that, you know, the general consensus is yes, as long as we use them in kind of this multi-dimensional standpoint. And then CARE 2.0 begins this fall. So we're starting, we've already started uh, June 1st. We started enrolling new subjects for our project this year. Uh, when we first started, we, we, we tested everyone every year, and at UD, that's 625 student athletes. That's a lot of athletes every year getting baseline testing. And then after year two, they decided that we no longer have to do that. So now what we do is we just enroll our new student athletes when they come in as freshmen or transfer student athletes. We do our complete baseline test. Our complete baseline workup takes about two and a half hours to finish. So I don't, I'm not going to say that to you today that you need to be doing that, but I'm going to share with you some of the tests that we do. And then CARE LONG, the intent of CARE LONG, LONG is for longitudinal, is much like some of these long-term cancer and heart disease studies, is that we're going to be able to monitor these student athletes over a long, long period of time. And it will be a select group from all 30 participating schools will participate in care long until the end of time. So this is the Grand Alliance. So these are all of the groups. Somehow Delaware made it to the top in the, in the very middle there. I have no idea, but it, we, we use it as good publicity for our program and our school. Um, so you can see some of the other schools. We're a very small school. We're a mid-major. We're a Division I. We play Division I AA football schedule. In the NCAA speak, that's NCAA uh, championship, right? So we're an FBSC school, so uh, we're not in part of the, um, the bowl championship series. And so, uh, you know, halfway decent football, but uh, not certainly power five level. God bless you. So this is just some of the data from our first three years in the project. Um, you can see we average around 40 concussions a year. We take all comers, so if an athlete gets concussed after a Friday night at the Deer Park in downtown Newark, Delaware, we're notified. We have to go and we do, do, do the follow-up test on that. So you can see that we have quite a few non-sport-related concussions in the group as well. Um, and this year was no different. So, uh, you know, quite a few student-athletes participating across. I think we have 19 or 20 different sports. This, uh, this is just a paper that talks about the, the methods, uh, how we collect the data. This is our baseline packet of information. So uh, basically, uh, you can see there, we, we do baseline 
We do symptoms, postural stability, and neurological status, neurocognitive assessment, and then we do some advanced testing as well. So I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the other assessments that we do. So our computerized neuropsych test is uh, IMPACT. So we, we, we've been using IMPACT for a number of years. There are some other readily available tools out there that maybe some of you use. But there is a neuropsychological component to that. We do the SCAT-5 evaluation, so that's built into our evaluation as well. Uh, the BSI, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that here in a second. The SAC, which you know is built into the SCAT-5. And the BAS, which is built into that as well. And then you can see that we also do some level B assessments. We do uh, C-theory logic, uh, advanced postural stability, reaction time, ocular motor, and then some quality life measurements as well. So it's pretty detailed. Uh, student athletes, I guess as freshmen, when they come in, they know no different. So uh, when our, we were testing the athletes on a continuous basis, they, it gets a little old because we don't pay them to participate. We are paying them now to exit. So do they, they do a baseline, and then as they exit the University of Delaware, they have to do an exit survey. And we're able to pay them $25. We give them a $25 uh, Amazon gift card. That's a big deal to them. And uh, they, they, they do the uh, baseline or the um, exit assessment for us. The exit assessment is not as lengthy. It only takes them about an hour of their time. And this is a, a, just a video representation of some of the testing that we do. So this is best. This is the Five, C3 four, tool. Three, two, one. It's just on an iPad. And then you can see the laptop computer as well. And I'll share this with you in a second. This is just a part of the SCAT-5 neuro screen. Good, you're gonna squeeze my finger as far as you possibly can. Good, you're gonna take your finger, go back and forth between your five This is just your uh, coordination assessment of the SCAT-5 tool. Finger to nose test. 